All right. Um, let's get started. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Kamesh Pamaraju. I am the senior product manager at Dell. Um, originally, I was supposed to give this talk. And as it turns out, um, fortunately for us, John Paul from UAB uh, was going to be here at the summit. And I said, what a better opportunity for us to have the customer himself right here talking about their experience. So it's, it's great for us to have John Paul with us um, here today. Uh, so I wanted to give you a very quick, brief overview of how we got engaged, um, Dell and uh, UAB. So this was back in, I guess, 2013, John Paul? Yeah. Early 2013. Yeah, yeah. When we first started talking with, mm -hmm. uh, with John Paul and UAB around some of the challenges and problems that they were facing. So a little bit of a backgrounder. Uh, and then John Paul is really going to go deep into the kind of things that they were dealing with at UAB and how they overcome some of their challenges and what benefits they're seeing. So let me first get start off with a little bit of a background. So when we first start, started talking, I was, in fact, I was the first guy on the phone, if you remember, John Paul. We were on the phone with UAB talking to John, uh, just trying to understand what is it that you're trying to accomplish? What are some of your challenges? And this is kind of what emerged, right? So UAB does a lot of great work in uh, cancer and genomics research. They get tons of funding. They had over 900 researchers. And one of the biggest challenges, it all started with storage, by the way. So we had a big storage discussion. And uh, they had, obviously, growing data, data sets. And that was challenging them. And how many of you kind of run into this kind of issue where your data is distributed across USBs, you know, laptops, USB drives, local servers, HPC clusters? How many of you? kind of run into this data distribution issue, right? So this is what they were, they were dealing with, right? Uh, and then they had this, they were using an HPC cluster, and they had to transfer data back and forth, and it was just taking too much time. It was clogging their networks. Um, and then, of course, as you can imagine, having distributed data management was a big problem. It was putting data at risk. It was causing productivity issues. So this was the problem they came to us with and said, hey, we have this problem. Data is growing like crazy. We've got all these researchers that have data spread all over the place. We need to get control over this stuff. How do we do it? So that's kind of how the conversation started. They said, we need a centralized data repository uh, for researchers. They have compliance things that they have to take care of. And on top of that, when we started talking, we said, hey, Dell, at Dell, we also do OpenStack. We, had, we do OpenStack. We, uh, we do data stuff. And they said, great. And we're also looking at OpenStack, and we want to try OpenStack out. And so at the end of the day, what UAB was looking for was a scale-out, cost-effective solution on hardware that can be used for both compute and storage. So that's how it all got started. And I know you guys sort of looked at uh, other things before you came to us. They looked at traditional SAN technologies. They looked at public cloud storage. They even looked at Hadoop clusters. And at the end of the day, after having the conversations with, with us, they, they chose us because we had a platform that gave them the best costs uh, in terms of uh, cost per gigabyte. And it also gave them a hardware where they can run both compute and storage. So it all came around Ink Tank Ceph, which you will hear from uh, John Paul today, which is one of the things we had been working on like seven months or eight months before we started talking to them. So we were able to deploy Ceph. We were able to make it work with OpenStack. We had networking architectures, reference architectures. Randy from Dell is here. He's been working very closely with UAB on, on the networking architectures because you need to tie everything together and, and, and have it deployed in an easy way so they can use it very quickly. So I will let um, kind of you know, hand over the baton here to John, and he will talk really all about what the journey they went through and how our partnership really benefited from, uh, from getting these solutions to their users. With that, John Paul, yeah. thanks, thanks for coming Kinesh. again. Appreciate really it. Appreciate yeah. So um, as Kinesh pointed out, we have um, an, an active community of, of data consumers. Um, but we didn't, we didn't really get here um, overnight. We, we've been, um, we're in the HPC space. We help our uh, customers, our researchers on campus, really do computation and analysis on their, on their data. And um, one of the uh, communities that started um, growing out and which was kind of starting to um, uh, bring this data problem to us was this next-gen sequencing community. But we, we'd been engaged in high-performance computing um, and in, if, 
folks familiar with that domain might know the, the, the distribution called Rocks. It's based on a CentOS fabric. And basically, it kind of brings an easy to build um, um, HPC fabric uh, to your center and uh, supports really easy scale out. You can just add servers that get, detects them. And so we were um, familiar with this model of, of scaling up. And we that's the model we like. Um, we uh, are certainly um, heavily invested in virtual machines. We had been doing that for the past decade for various services. And um, we'd been engaged over the last decade on the, the, the theme in the high performance computing community was grids. And uh, I'm not sure how familiar you all might be with grids, but they were basically the, the same kind of ideas that we talk in terms of cloud computing, but kind of geared around the high performance computing community. Um, ultimately, they focused more on job distribution across um, organizational boundaries. But the, the, the basic ideas made what, uh, what what grids are or were, they were the kind of the proto cloud. And so we had been engaged in a variety of meta schedulers and, and technology of how to spread workloads across different cluster boundaries. And one of those uh, meta schedulers was called Gridway. And the Gridway team ultimately um, kind of morphed their um, distribution model of jobs to actually being not just jobs, but actual VMs, and, and led to their development of Open Nebula. So we'd been having our fingers and toes in the water, kind of keeping a pulse on the activity that was going on in that community. Um, and uh, it, you know, a, a DevOps model was was inherent in how we how we worked. So we were kind of primed for migrating to to this environment. Uh, nonetheless, um, there were still lots of questions and lots of decisions to be made. Um, there's not just one hypervisor. There's not just one cloud technology. So there's lots of various things, and, and you need talent and skill and expertise. And so can, can we actually build from scratch an environment like this here? Um, of course, then we also have customers. Um, and as, as we mentioned, our customers were saying, data, data. They had run into their, their problem, their big data problem, and, and were realizing that you know, this is kind of annoying to have to move this stuff around campus back and forth to the cluster. We didn't have any um, uh, storage on our cluster that was de designated for long-term storage for large data sets. We had some scratch space available um, that was uh, available for their compute jobs, but not long-term. And, and they didn't stop asking for computing, so we were well aware that even though we wanted to build out a data fabric, we needed to be able to also address the uh, ongoing compute growth. So what this really talk, what this really is about is something called data intensive scientific computing. So um, with all these kind of um, ideas in mind, we essentially started off in August uh, 2012 and bought another fabric uh, from, uh, for our um, HPC cluster that we were going to designate for some type of data intensive workflow that had computation attached to it. Um, and so we bought a, a complement 10 um, 720XDs. They were decked out with uh, um, 36 terabytes of disk space, three terabyte um, disks, uh, lots of RAM so that we could do computing and lots of cores so that we could do, do computing. And we were like, all right, let's, let's do this, whatever this was gonna be. Um, and so we now had to integrate it. Well, um, quarter went by. Um, we were busy doing some other stuff we had to deal with at the time, but we were also realizing, um, you know, it's, it's not easy to just, all right, let's, how are we going to pass this through the organization and get, get adoption and get what we need in order to tie all these pieces together? And um, if you're like me, so Bob Cloud, Bob Cloud, um, I think the cloud is named in honor of him, but um, he's, he's my boss's boss or my boss. I'm not quite sure what the relationship is there, but nonetheless, um, he went to Dell World back in December 2012 and um, uh, sent me an email um, uh, while he was there and uh, telling me about some information that he was learning. And I don't know about y'all, but when your bosses go to, go to a conference, it's a little bit concerning because they often come back with stuff and you're like, uh, wait a minute. Uh, I was I was doing that, you know, right here. Was, we've been talking about it, um, and uh, you know, but this email was exciting because I, I read some words in there that were I like. Um, <laughs> He heard about OpenStack, and I'd never really heard about staff, but um, it didn't take me a, lo a little bit of Googling to uh, learn what I needed to learn about staff, and um, that was a little gem in this whole package. And so, so I said, uh, wow, that's good to hear. Um, 
I've been thinking a lot about Dell in this, um, in this scenario, and specifically around the fact that we need some sort of a vehicle to help bring this in, in, into place. We, it was, we, we had the technology, we had the know-how, we just didn't have the capacity. And so um, that brought me to lesson one. Um, you, be sure to recognize when a partnership's gonna help you um, achieve your goals. And, and that was, it was an important lesson for me, but it was, uh, it was really nice to be able to turn to a vendor space and see a vendor speaking the same language that we were speaking and wanted to be speaking. So we weren't, we weren't running into that situation where your boss comes up with a great idea that is now 100% different from everything you've been doing for the last 10 years. Um, it was very much in line with where we wanted to go. And so um, we moved forward with an implementation. It was a very easy decision to, to say technologically this is what we wanted. Um, the, the implementation had, um, of course, the OpenStack components. It had the Ceph component. It was built around a, an automatic deploy fabric. It, was, it had Ganglia in there. It had Nagios in there. It was, it was just... It was comfortable. It was just familiar. We knew what we were doing in that space. And so um, by March, we had, our, our, had committed to the fabric. And um, within about six weeks, we had the team from Dell uh, come on site with Randy and his team. Um, and at the end of a week, we had our fabric deployed. We had our proof of concept in place. And we had a cloud on, on campus. Um, it was great. Um, it was nice to work with people who knew what they were doing, to, to be engaged in the same kind of space and, and, and that kind of um, thing. So uh, the next step was to really kind of build adoption for this. Um, the, um, we had a couple of different ideas. We had the, um, of course, the, the storage model that we wanted to, uh, to promote and, and, and build out for the campus researchers. And that's the Ceph component that brought that in, made it possible for us to really tie our uh, uh, servers together, our storage servers together. Um, and the image component within, or let's say the RBD image component, the Rados block device imaging component, was a key component of that uh, Ceph deploy that let us uh, bring this stuff together. For those familiar with Hadoop, you know, Hadoop is this um, nice, wonderful way to aggregate storage in kind of a similar fashion and tie in computing. What we had in our space um, was we had a very traditional file system based user community that really needed to still have that file system abstraction on top of their storage fabric. And so that's something that Ceph was really geared towards providing for us. We, uh, we could take um, manifest an image across this 36, uh, you know, 360 terabytes of, of storage um, and just basically pull it together, slap a um, file system on top of it, and access it via NFS. And, and that's what um, we ultimately get to. I'll have a slide about that in a minute. Um, more generally, um, we were focused on also promoting cloud adoption within IT and with the research community, and then demonstrating its utility with application. And, and I think that's a, that's a really um, important component. Once, um, once you have a cloud in place is the, is the joy and pleasure of being able to build applications on it. Uh, Along with um, researchers' demands for data, they had also expressed a desire for a better backup um, solution. One of the things that we say on the cluster is that um, there are no backups on the cluster. Um, if you're not managing a data backup solution, you don't have backups. Um, we, it's, the, the reason for it isn't a, um, a disrespect to their data. It's more about the fact that the data owner knows what's valuable, and a, a, a platform provider can't guess what's really valuable to the user. Everything looks valuable, and these people are dealing with uh, terabyte data set sizes, and if we don't have enough storage to store their primary data sets, we certainly don't have enough storage to duplicate that and just make a backup um, out of the, the blue for it. Um, and to, to maintain backup support. So we, we work with um, a product called Crash Plan, which is a nice user and user oriented um, solution and uh, started uh, deploying that. It was a really easy you know, couple of hours to deploy a, the, the required fabrics. You just kind of read through the specs and say, okay, I need one of these, one of these, one of these, and you put it in place. And then the vendor came on site, helped us get their, their the little, do a little bootstrap series and uh, had that in place uh, within an afternoon. There was nothing like, uh, oh, well, we have to you know, go jigger with this or mess with this, or um, we just kind of were sitting at our web interface and clicking through and taking care of the, the network requirements at the lawn the same way as we were uh, deploying the, the fabric. Another example that I deployed somewhat recently was uh, GitLab. Um, I don't know if you all know GitLab, but you certainly know GitHub. GitLab's like your own GitHub, uh, built out of um, some of the same models for um, oops, 
excuse me, um, built out of some of the same models for basically a web page or website based uh, repository where you can engage and, and uh, do issue management and bug fixing. That was really easy. Um, <laughs> I just went to the GitLab site and said, oh, okay, so a server about this size, I needed X amount of storage, um, and uh, just kind of hooked that up into the, into the VM space and, and was up and running. Um, uh, as a side effect, a beautiful side effect, or just a coincidence, it also it used the Omnibus installer, and that has a, a chef component for the automation component inside of the GitLab deploy. And that was a nice synergistic thing because the underlying um, automation fabric for our OpenStack fabric deployed by Dell also uses chef currently. And so um, that was just, it was kind of a nice little cool factor. It's like, oh, okay, so now I get to actually have that layered deploy that you see in the cloud. You know, your cloud provider does some sort of magic underneath the hood to make all of this stuff plug together and deploy quickly, and then you sit on top, and you really have the same problem. You're gonna have some collection of infrastructure that you need to manage, and so now you have tools available, um, and there's potential synergies if you're the, one, the same person doing the both ends of the equation, or you can go your own way as a cloud consumer. But the storage component, again, is really nice in this. I, I mentioned that on the um, on the crash plan, we just kind of needed 10 more terabytes uh, for store for backup storage, and so I just went to my uh, cloud interface. I clicked the button, said create myself a volume, attach it to this machine, and then I went inside the machine and said you know mount it and, and add it to the crash plan configuration, um, and that's all thin provisioned right outside of the OpenStack stack, which is hooked into Ceph. And so I'm just pulling my storage in from across these commodity servers and making it available to applications in my, in my fabric. So, so big wins from my perspective. Our, our bigger, um, our more effort-filled um, solution was the research storage solution. And, and that was, I say effort-filled because it was some in-house programming that we did to, to develop this. But it's mainly, the concept is pretty easy to understand. We, we create um, image containers, much like SAN, and LUNs inside of um, uh, Ceph, uh, and then we attach them to a server, which is going to NFS export them to the client, and we lay down a file system on top of the container, and that lets the uh, end user consumer really deal with their native file uh, uh, manipulation operations on the cluster and maintain this uh, container with their data sets inside of it. And then the benefit, of course, is that those containers can grow to any size. We we started off with this, this model of your first terabyte free kind of as a, as a teaser to get people engaged and, um, and thinking, and also as, a, as out of respect of the growth of data and research, that um, a terabyte is really a thinking man's amount of storage nowadays inside the research space. Um, you need to give people enough room to move their elbows and do some stuff. Um, and uh, so, you know, that, the basic architecture is, is kind of familiar to those of us who do NFS servers. Uh, the, the experience, of course, is, is a lot of fun um, with, with, with Ceph and, and, and these kind of components. Um, so we, you know, we did some scripting to, to provision our, our, our storage, and it was real quick. We did the, um, the uh, deployment very quickly. Uh, just we had about 110, maybe 120 users that we were uh, the, our initial batch. And so we just broke them down into batches of 10. It was really easy. We scaled it out and, and just quickly manifested a bunch of thin provision containers across the cluster. And within maybe five, seven minutes, we had um, all of our storage online and available to our users. So I thought that was really pretty cool. I, I get excited about those kind of numbers as an HPC dude. Um, and. Uh, I also get excited about pictures like this. Um, I tend to like my pictures look a little bit less choppy than the one on the left, but that was my fault. I should have taken a picture when it was live. I let my RDD uh, ba database basically uh, go towards a, a more condensed view. Um, but this is a picture of what happens when you need more storage. Um, so I was you know, mentioning that we had uh, 10 servers uh, uh, that we aggregated with Ceph. Well, we got um, to the point where after making this um, research storage um, uh, available to our researchers, well, you know, go figure, they go put data in it. Um, and they started moving data into it. And 
well, I was watching my numbers and I was saying, ooh, okay, so they're getting kind of close to a full point and so I need to get another server online. So I went and I, I plugged in my server and I said, well, let me just add some more, more data. And I was just, I was just kind of left off the, left it all, not all the defaults and just kind of provisioned it, you know, with the, the provisioning fabric, the crowbar provisioning fabric. And, um, well, I watched to see what would happen. And, and so this on the left-hand side, I know the numbers that are scaling up on the left are a little bit, um, a little bit small, but at the top it says 500 M and it's in bytes per second, so that's 500 megabytes, five gigabits per second. Um, and that big vertical jump there is um, what happened when I, when I said become a Ceph node. And uh, so it said, okay, and it went and made itself a Ceph node and told the rest of the fabric, hey, I'm here, and Ceph starts to rebalance itself. And so data just started flowing to this node. And we have a 10 gigabit network, so it's only about half of the network that we're talking about here. Um, but a really nice, this, what this looks like in my world is a great job. Um, and so um, it it's, you know, basically scales up. And you can see this is one of the OSDs that were actually being filled by this rebalancing effort. Um, so we were about uh, probably 75% full um, at, the, at the start of this operation, kind of probably stepped down to, um, I don't know, maybe 60%. I did actually, I actually went and added another service, so we're below 50% again now. But each time I did it, I basically saw the same kind of pattern. A nice, steady, um, uh, this is a, a Nagios uh, graph over here on the right-hand side, a ganglia graph on the left. Um, and we see just a, a nice, steady uh, data growth pattern in here, and we see it going from essentially zero bytes on the disk to its eventual balance point of um, a little bit over, let me get a terabyte and point, a terabyte and 1.3, maybe 1.4 terabytes. Of course, then I went ahead and added another one, and so everything we have right now is about roughly half full. So, uh, the, use it. <laughs> That's what it's for. That's the nice thing about this proof of concept. We got back past the whole rubbing our heads and scratching and thinking, okay, so how are we going to get this in place to having it in place and being able to actually leverage it for the things that we were interested in doing. Um, and so what that gets you to the point of doing is thinking in terms of cloud. You're no longer thinking in terms of your, your infrastructure, you're thinking in terms of what you can now do with it. And, uh, and that's a really important transition that you need to go through and bringing your own private cloud into, into the um, space is, is really helpful for that. So, of course, you have to make decisions up front. You don't ever know what the, what the right one is. So this is kind of like a little bit of a grab bag of some of the things that we did early on and, and, and how we've uh, adapted over the, over the past year from our deployment. Uh, mostly it's been really good. Um, the decision that we made going forward. I think I want to point one out in particular, um, which is the um, the, the sizing of your network. Um, don't, don't think too small. Think in terms of like what your network, your own network architecture looks like. In, um, in UAB, we have two class B ranges. We're a large campus. Um, so what we did is we said, um, well, you know, why not just run a whole class B off of this fabric? So we went ahead and sized it accordingly. And it's actually um, benefited us tremendously because it allows us to map pretty freely over to the, to the VMs and stuff that we deploy in the, in the class, um, in the, VMware uh, in the OpenStack space. Um, the uh, other, um, let's see here. Um, the yeah, the other thing that we noticed is that you know at first you're kind of cautious. You're like, well, this is all automatically provisioned, and but there's there's ranges in there that um, you know are set aside, and and you can work and and kind of hook your own custom interfacing nodes into the space, and it, and it's a comfortable thing to do, and and that gets you um, access. That's how we actually do our. Um, uh, our research storage is we actually created a, an NFS server that's sitting right on top of our storage network and um, uh, consuming the images directly from that backend network. Um, and uh, another caution would be to um, <laughs> You've got to watch out for the people who are, are excessively paranoid. Um, that's a good thing. I don't want to say it's necessarily all bad, but. Um, you bring something unfamiliar into the environment and they get extremely paranoid. And so um, kind of be sure to, OpenStack is not crazy or anything like that, so it's, it's a comfortable space. So be sure to stand your ground and, and make sure you get your deploy in that you want because if your fabric's inaccessible, it's unusable. So um, the, I think one of the, the fun things that I fixed was uh, we had kind of a, a range of IP addresses that we'd opened up and um, 
well, they didn't quite match up with what we wanted, so we used the fabric to fix, the, um, fix it with getting some reservations out of the way. And so the, the lesson here is uh, use the fabric, it's flexible, use it to your advantage and, and make sure to help it, let it help you solve your problems. But uh, problems will arise. Um, and we, we uncovered a couple of ones that were a little bit of a, a, little bit of a bump in our road. Um, one of them, as we started looking at the um, performance characteristics of our environment, um, we uh, were noticing with, with iPerf, that's how we test our network performance, we were noticing some sort of really jumpy and um, jittery uh, performance on our, our uh, 10 giggy fabric um, within the, in the Ceph um, space. And we eventually tracked it down to a, um, a upstream uh, packaging of the um, Intel uh, driver that was uh, um, embedded inside the uh, Ubuntu distribution that we had on our fabric. Um, it was a fairly simple fix to just then update the driver and we saw a nice clean line at 10 gigabits per second or just you know, a hair underneath 10 gigabits per second. Um, but uh, an important part of that is remember that there's an upstream to these and that there's a, a healthy community upstream and you need to make sure to not just look at your vendor, but look at the community upstream because this, this particular problem happened all the way in the kernel deploy space and how the relationship between the mainline kernel and the um, driver um, database, uh, the driver um, integration goes. Now this is not an issue in modern Ubuntu boxes, so this is morely, more of kind of a historical note and an educational note. But um, the other, um, the other uh, thing that is, sometimes you go through these processes to fix something and you um, coincidentally break something else, maybe accidentally. Um, uh, but, but again, um, you have a, a, you know, lots of moving parts that might be a little bit complicated, but there's, there's places you can go in the open source community and you can see how this fabric was, was built together. It's kind of like becoming um, familiar with how your car was manufactured and, and knowing what the distribution network looks like and then being able to uh, be uh, deeply engaged in a, in a primary authority on what you need to essentially change inside your fabric. Um, in order to fix it or make it uh, better or, you know, we, we've heard a lot of the talks talking about how, uh, you know, making sure that things go back upstream. And so don't forget that there's an upstream and, and, and uh, solid communities upstream to, to work with. Just work methodic methodically. Um, you'll learn a lot as you go along um, and um, respect the, the tool boundaries as you kind of work through this. It's not, it's not some sort of a magic um, environment. There they really is a very disciplined transition between different components. Um, and this is, this is just a, for the, the folks who like to read Bash, this is an example of one of the problems that I ran into. I like it in particular because it is actually a problem. I mean, it, it was, that was the problem. It was a, the, the, one of my nodes basically went into a funky state and I couldn't figure out what the, what the issue was. And so, you know, I had to go through and um, kind of step through the different spaces. And this particular snippet of code is something that happens during the boot sequence. And um, it essentially is going through and, and running a chef client to make sure that there's a sane environment. This is part of the kind of the, um, by provisioning myself where I'm in, in, in operational mode um, step. So uh, kind of long story short, it goes through some of these problems, but I mean, some of these steps, and if it, if it can't succeed, well, it, it does what it should do. It says, there's a problem. And so it says final state problem and it reports that up to the um, management fabric and the management fabric brings your, brings your system red. Um, so in the end, um, the, 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 the solution um, was, uh, in this particular case, is that uh, was to um, either reboot the node or rerun this um, in initialization script and get myself back into a sane environment. What I had done was I had rebooted something um, when my, one of my primary uh, uh, components, the administrative component, um, was offline and I had set myself in a tailspin. But it was, uh, again, not hard to fix. And the important part is that um, the code is the documentation. Um, and that's, that's an extremely good thing, is that you're not left, you know, I, I wasn't sitting there looking at a black box and saying, geez, I, I really kind of wish that um, I knew what was going on here. Um, I'm kind of up the creek here and I, I don't know what to do. Well, I could start reading my way through it and really understanding what is the process. And it's, it's just a very logical process. It's, it's what a system administrator would do. It would say, okay, well, I'm trying to you know, bring this thing provisioned and it's not working so that there's a problem. Well, instead of having a sysadmin do that, and my computer did it for me and let me know. And so read, the, the code is a good thing. So where are we today? Well, 
As far as um, the research computing system, that's the environment that we provide to our researchers. OpenStack and Ceph are here to stay. That's, there's a kind of a no question about that. It's, it's provided us with a lot of flexibility with respect to storage, and it's also providing us with a lot of flexibility with respect to adding new workflow opportunities to the research community, specifically around um, models where they just want to, um, you know, they're kind of trying out some sort of new product, they go online and they say, hey, look, someone's got this working on Ubuntu and all I have to do is click some buttons and I can make that happen. And so we can now give them an environment in the, in the cloud space where they can spin up these VMs and kind of think through this. Um, one of the key components that we've been de dealing with, I was mentioning early on that we're kind of like a, you know, we've been thinking about DevOps for a long time and trying to operate along that model with VMs. So we had our own kind of proto cloud in place that was just like KVM and, and different bits and tied together. Uh, we built our Galaxy next-gen sequencing um, platform, which is a web-based interface for uh, next-gen sequencers to um, users to basically upload data, send it through their um, alignment processes and do post-processing on their data. It's a really nice little tool to get um, researchers up and running. But we're running that right now in our, um, our proto cloud, our KVM fabric. So what we want to do now is move that over to our OpenStack fabric and really put the, the, the keys in the hand of the, the research community that manages that fabric without having to worry about you know, their relationship with the rest of our systems in our environment. They're gonna be sitting on the cloud and they'll be authoritative. We want to add some object storage services. We started off with the research um, storage, the imaging component, um, but Ceph also has an object store embedded with it. Of course, there's Swift from the OpenStack fabric. Uh, we, weren't, we haven't seen a lot of our use cases really um, come from the research community um, leveraging that, but uh, one example is now Galaxy is starting to work it into their own workflow so that researchers can publish objects out of the Galaxy fabric, so that'll be a nice tie-in. Um, and then uh, you know, making sure that the researchers can actually t uh, touch this directly. They don't have to touch it um, by way of um, our own infrastructure um, hands. Uh, but the big question is how, how far can we really take this? Um, and I, I think from, from my uh, perspective, um, the, the reason why you do process automation is, is scaling. That's what we've known in the HPC environment. It's what's needed to be done in um, traditional um, environments as well. Um, whether it's a little research shop that starts off with their one VM and then says, well, now I've got um, you know, 25 files. I'd really like 25 VMs because it takes an hour. And then I can keep my um, computational time the same. Um, the uh, the uh, manual processes and steps are, are a real cost, and as you as you automate those and document those through code, um, you begin to save on that. Um, and and then I in my in my mind, success is really around dual use. It's about being able to satisfy your needs internally and your customers' um, demands and needs. Um, uh, because you're documenting, I mean, writing code, you're documenting your own internal processes. From a um, from a research perspective, it's um, you know be, it's repeatability and, and reliability, and then um, generally. Um, we have the talent in-house. People can do system administration self-help, and that turns into future systems developers. Um, and traditional models are just, just ripe for replacement, so you know, just be aware. So I'm hoping there might be a lesson five. Um, can we learn from research and, and engage as a partner? I think that that's a lesson that's actually very apparent here in the OpenStack uh, conference. So, oh, Let me pass this back on to you. Okay, so can you hear me? Okay, thank you. Um, so, well, I have a couple of questions for you before I open it up for the audience. Um, so you know that Ceph has a file system mm -hmm. called CephFS, mm -hmm. which kind of helps you with scalable file storage mm -hmm. that can be shared amongst m multiple users. Mm -hmm. Sounds like you're mainly using this for block storage, mm -hmm. like RBD, mm -hmm. and individual users kind of put their own file system on it, right? Mm -hmm. So is there, are there plans to go forward? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm very interested in what CephFS has to offer. It's, yeah. a, it's a very, uh, it's got some extremely interesting uh, models around checkpointing um, and being able to just let the end user um, touch a file that then creates you a checkpoint. Yeah. So from that perspective, I'm very interested in it. We're, of course, an HPC shop, so yeah. um, distributed file systems are, are ranked high. It's mainly been an issue of time and what we can explore over the past year so that we haven't brought that online. Okay, perfect. So a couple of quick um, note here. There is a, if you want to learn more about OpenStack and Ceph, there's a deep dive session that's happening today at 2 p.m., room number 313. 
Uh, we're going to have uh, Neil Levine from Ink Tank, who is their product guy, um, really go deep into what's coming next in, in Ceph. And we at Dell have been working on creating reference architectures that'll help you sort of scope and plan your implementation and look at the kinds of um, architectures you need to build out your Ceph cloud. So make sure you come over to 313 at, uh, at uh, 2 o'clock today. Um, do we have time for questions? Maybe one or two? Yeah, right, go ahead. So you spoke a lot about, uh, Can you use the mic, please? Oh, sure. Yeah. Yes, you spoke a lot about uh, operational efficiencies. And um, can you speak a little bit about uh, what you looked at in terms of compliance and data security concerns as you were moving to OpenStack? Yeah, so um, we did treat this as a proof of concept. And one of the things that we were trying to understand was how, how does this fabric operate so that we can essentially engage in a compliance and data security conversation around it. Um, we've, I mean, it's an active dialogue on our campus. Um, I don't see anything inside the OpenStack fabric from what I've been looking this year that doesn't fit within those um, models. It's really an, a question of how you're deploying it and who you're letting have access to run it. Um, uh, you know, um, from from what we've been seeing, it's it's a lot about um, the the compliance issues are a lot about um, uh, documenting your process and following what you've documented. It's a, it's a back and forth. It's a, it's a downstream and an upstream. So it's kind of got this nice um, pattern to it. So I'm 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 very confident that that we'll be able to get that. Now um, there are features, of course, that within even our research community on campus, um, we have some researchers that are looking into actual um, pr um, provenance issues baked right into OpenStack um, that would hopefully be useful in the future within that kind of a space. But all of the models around the DevOps and, and you know, essentially coding in, baking in your documentation and your process, I think those are good, strong foundations that we can build on to, to get into our compliance um, uh, uh, frameworks that we need. So, Okay, any other? Yeah, maybe we have a time for one more question, yeah. Um, Ceph seems to have a, um, a feature where you can actually run computation on the Ceph nodes. I haven't mm -hmm. tried it personally, so uh, I was uh, wondering whether it is something you will be looking at, what are the use cases, etc. Yeah, um, absolutely. That's that's my um, my little dream right there. Um, I, we mainly separated this out from a sanity perspective. Um, uh, the um, reference architecture that we were working on with Dell, as Kamesh mentioned, they had been working with Ink Tank for about six or seven months prior to our engagement. Um, it, was, it was about, a, a, if you will, a kind of a clean room separation. And so we wanted to just kind of respect that um, existing distribution. Uh, but we're very, very interested in being able to consume the computational capacity that's on those nodes. We bought them for that purpose, for um, data intensive computing. Um, there's some interesting models in the Ceph community around Hadoop and uh, being able to lay a Hadoop file system on top of Ceph. I haven't looked into that deeply, although uh, our, our NGS upgrades that we want to do this summer are probably going to investigate that more clearly because of the alignment processes that, they're, um, that they rely on the, uh, the, the tuxedo tools, I, I believe now support um, uh, distribution via Hadoop um, framework. So it's, it's definitely on the model. Uh, backfilling with Condor is something that I think is very appealing because Condor is very good at just getting the heck out of the way when you've got to do something like rebalance your cluster because you've got a, a new node added. And uh, we'll be talking a lot about that at 2 o'clock in terms of you know, how do you balance your clusters, what are the considerations around hardware, compute, storage. So feel free to come over there. I think we're out of time now. Let's uh, give a big round of applause to John Paul. Thank you for coming. <laughs>